Can I get a oh, oh yeah? Oh no. Where's everyone going? Bingo? I feel like it's within everyone's best interests here if I preface this review with a warning. You see, I don't have a lot of experience with games like Resident Evil 4. I don't want to completely piss on my own parade before it's even gotten going. I just want to have this out on the table before you get invested in what I'm saying. I'm sure this review will pique the interest of a few people who've played the game back in the day, and I don't want to rustle any jimmies, but I do want you to know that Resident Evil 4 has aged pretty poorly. Like, much of it has rotten away. Like, the control scheme is the bunch of vegetables I buy when I'm feeling healthy, except now it's six weeks later and I've found them in the puddle in the bottom of my fridge. It's old ass. The sad reality is that video game user experience has just moved on. In the 15 years since this game has come out, it's only natural that developers would find a better way to guide players through games and communicate their objectives to them. Yeah, it can often be whiny hand-holding, but it's better than no communication at all. Still, no need to fret quite yet. My wide-eyed perspective could be a good thing. I'm fresh-faced and I can judge at face value. On the other hand, this game is old and dated and can only be fully appreciated by someone who played it back in the day. And I certainly didn't do that. I didn't buy my PlayStation 4 until 2018, and it wasn't until I was comfortably streaming that a specific title caught my eye. Resident Evil 4. A quick note before I get on with this review, but please consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel if you enjoy it. I post gaming videos a few times a month, so if that interests you, please subscribe for more. Anyway, I'd heard of Resident Evil, sure. Who hasn't? To me, Resident Evil 4 was the bully three years above me in school. Someone for whom I was too slim a picking to bother with? Instead, they hung over our class like a shadowy cabal, name uttered only in whispers. I never came into contact with it. I didn't know anything about it, so when it entered the next game poll on my channel and single-handedly stole the majority. I was curious about its apparent quality, to say the least. In case you are one of the people who never played a Resident Evil game, and honestly, please make yourself known, my self-esteem relies on it. Resident Evil 4 was released on the GameCube and PlayStation 2 in January of 2005, so I was nine years old. This was literally me. The PlayStation 4 re-release came in 2019. From what I remember being told, it changed a few inconsequential facets of gameplay, such as different modes no longer being required to be played for bottle caps, but I actually can't find anything about it online and I don't know what to google, so I can't talk about it as a fact. There isn't a platinum trophy for Resident Evil 4 for some reason, so we just went for 100%. It only has 12 trophies, bless it, but they required a considered approach, i.e. a careful run on easy mode, professional mode, some hilarious shooting range minigame, and a run through Ada's optional missions to acquire all the costumes in the game. Some of the trophies, such as triggering some big lake salamander or killing one of the later bosses, were missable, so I had to be careful to achieve everything in two playthroughs. I came away from my quest through Resident Evil 4 with a strange respect for it. The game handles like shit, at least in my opinion. Many viewers who played the game before when they were younger hadn't noticed any problems with the controls. I guess it's just a case of being too late to the party. I missed the boat back when games like Resident Evil 4 were the peak of gaming tech, so now I lumber through it like some kind of reverse caveman, travelling to the past only to get stuck on a wall or forget that I can't turn my camera in this weird new dimension. Resident Evil 4, the white man's burden, focuses on Leon Kennedy, a government agent on the search for the kidnapped president's daughter, Ashley. He drops into a small, impoverished village with no electricity, running water, or proper sanitation, and finds that the locals have been infected with a horrible parasite that literally rips them open from the inside. The source of this parasite is some strange man who controls the infrastructure, upper class, and religion of the region. He lies to the locals about the potential of this new power, indoctrinates them into a cult, and murders any naysayers or outsiders. No one can leave, so it's change or die. Consumed by pain and fear and horrible pestilence, these maddened, helpless locals are now gunned down by Leon with automatic rifles, set alight with incendiary grenades, and stabbed to death while they flail around with pitchforks, completely unable to control their own actions as the parasite burrows into their body and takes over. Concluding shockingly quickly and without question that the locals are beyond saving, Leon whips up a quick antidote for himself and his escort and bails, leaving them to die alone. Rest in peace, Cabron man. 
The whole experience is pretty short actually, all things considered, but it's good and it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's like a good poo or a perfect spaghetti bolognese. One of those experiences that you can't quite define, but you know it when you find it, and you savour it for everything that it is, and you have to take your shirt off for it. In fact, it seems like some set pieces were cut from the game and reused for the optional extra aid missions, giving you a valid reason to play them besides just listening to some snarky dialogue from an overall very unlikable character, and whatever Wesker is talking about. They're really fun set pieces too, but maybe they slowed down the pacing of the main game or weren't quite finished in time for the initial release, so they were removed, which is a pretty bold move for a game that can be finished in about 8 hours. Speaking of optional extras, the target practice missions also provided a fun bit of levity to break up the tension, especially in later levels when the stress becomes so palpable that I can feel my life expectancy lowering by the second. I did the target practice missions during my professional mode playthrough, an utterly harrowing crawl through one of the most anus clenching game modes I've ever played, requiring absolutely every scrap of strategic thinking I could muster just to make it past the most basic enemies. I tell you, the utterly pants sweating relief I felt upon arriving at a target practice mission, seeing that goofy ass sail when waiting patiently for me at his little desk was indescribably blissful. My easy mode blind run was finished in maybe 15 or 16 hours, and with that practice under the belt and a stainless steel escort, the professional playthrough, mercifully, only took 12, which was welcome since I could feel my blood pressure soaring throughout. This game does not let up. Resident Evil 4 knows the art of escalation. Every time you think the worst is behind you, you stumble balls first into something even worse. Rinse and repeat and repeat and repeat. Everything you discover is somehow 10 times worse than anywhere you've been so far, and this game is utterly expert at slowly upping the heat until you're sprinting, screaming past regenerators, reduced to some whimpering animal in the face of every new fear. And fear it was. On my easy mode playthrough I absolutely scurried through the village, tripped and fell up past the church, sobbed my way through the sieges on the cottage, scrambled past the two chainsaw women, reluctantly weathered the ski lift and sprinted up the hill, assuming the end was in sight, to find myself in the face of an enormous castle? Oh, well, this probably isn't the end of the game. No, it's not. It's a gauntlet of hell, spanning probably an entire quarter of the game, ending with an utterly horrifying boss. Seriously, the castle segment feels so long. It's a winding series of corridors, puzzles, and gauntlets of enemies that goes on and on and on. It feels like you'll never escape, a likely intentional move, and honestly, one I respect. And then you go to a military island, the most stereotypical of relaxing settings where everything is fine and there are no problems. I can assure you in a manner most sarcastic. Speaking of Gauntlet of Hell, the bosses in this game each have their own gimmick. Between slamming doors closed on their head, knocking them down so you can climb up and stab their eye, and having them remove another item of clothing between every cutscene, Resident Evil 4 has you covered. My favourite boss was the latter one. His name was Trouser or something? And just removed items of clothing until our final fight, our emotional climax, was basically just Leon standing off against some outraged nudist. The first boss is an enormous tadpole. Leon squats in a boat tethered to this great big lump and steers around flotsam on the surface of the lake, firing harpoons at this big gobbed Moby Dick until it stops moving. There's also a fellow late game who looks like alien and predator, and I literally ran out of ammo when I was fighting him on easy mode so I had to awkwardly bail like a dine and dasher and just leave him in the sewers by himself. Turns out he takes one single rocket to the face regardless of the mode you're on, so he was weirdly easy on my professional mode return. Just whack a barrel of ice chemical, freeze him like a popsicle, and deploy a rocket propelled grenade into his sternum. Easy peasy. Our boy Liam Candy also magically learns how to dodge, duck, and weave during this fight too. I don't know why it took until this specific moment for him to suddenly bother to learn. The sheer fear of meeting this guy in a dark tunnel probably completely rewired his brain and respect him to Dex, but it was short-lived and Liam immediately forgets how to do it as soon as he's clear so there's no such luck during basic encounters for the rest of the game. That's not even the core of the problem. Tank controls. On a man who is not that tanky. Why, Capcom, why? I ran into another situation wherein I came to a big gap in a bridge. I knew that Lee and Cindy couldn't jump. There's no jump control in the game, so I spent a long time trying to find a way across. I tried to shoot distant targets with my extremely limited ammo. I tried to go back to the church to maybe find another door or secret passage that would allow me to pop out on the other side. I even went back to the village to see if I'd missed the key to the church. Nothing, I was frustrated, wandering around for ages when I decided to see if I could shimmy over the planks connecting the two broken bridges. The prompt for jump over appeared. The prompt. The prompt to jump. 
The prompt to do the one thing that this government agent seems to be completely unable to do appeared to me. Because he suddenly could jump, but like a bitter spouse, the game refused to tell me and just watched me, eyebrow raised and feet tapping as I struggled to the conclusion by myself. I guess a part of this is my own problem. Video game UX has come a long way. It's impossible to play a recent release and not see some form of implicit guidance. How lighting and colour is used to implicitly direct a player's movement in games like Mirror's Edge and Doom. How games like GTA 5 and Skyrim make use of objective markers to point out specific locations to visit. The Witcher 3 has excellent user experience at all times. At all times, and the bottom right is a key for actions you can take, with controls always visible. Like the Batman series, it makes use of detective mode, so even if you're stuck, you'll be able to discern the next steps by using your Witcher sensors. Yay. I can't blame Resident Evil 4 for not being upfront with me. It's a criticism I'm sure the studio has heard a thousand times and learned from, so I can't seriously add to the pile. But you should have told me he could jump. Liam is only capable of moving quickly in quick time events, another semi-relic from the semi-past that showed up a ton back in the day, but only really appear in a few select titles nowadays, probably because they're so often trial and error based that without weirdly alert reflexes you'll always fail it the first time. And since I'm not a house cat, unfortunately I was never that lucky. I had to learn very quickly to completely forget that the right analogue stick existed. Every time my 2020 gaming brain tried to turn the camera around to get a good look at whatever cabron shouting maniac was jamming a pitchfork into my kidney, I'd shove the right stick on instant and end up watching Leon Kennedy fumble around in confusion, unable to understand how to turn his head. Leon can melee enemies that are close by, but the execution is downright weird. You need to hold L1 before Leon can enter melee mode, at which point he can turn on his axis and stab enemies in different directions, very slowly, may I add, but Leon literally cannot move in this mode. You can't walk up to enemies and knife them, so if you, like me, misjudge the distance you are from an enemy and miss them with your weird horizontal stab, seriously Leon ever heard of thrust? You have to come out of the mode, step forward an inch, go back into the mode, and awkwardly fail until the enemy stops moving. Throughout two playthroughs and almost 30 hours total, I never truly got the hang of it. Every time I felt like I'd become comfortable with the game, I would suddenly revert to my primeval gamer brain and everything would be lost again. Speaking of trial and error quick time events, Salazar was a fucking nightmare for those. In one instance I saw a quick time event pop up. I pressed the button to dodge, then as I came out of my quick time invincibility, I was immediately grabbed and crunched by an insta-kill mouth tentacle attack. In professional mode, I just pried him open with the magnum revolver and put a rocket launcher in his mouth. Bish bash bosh. The U2 guy, Yubi? Yubi Tubi? can't remember, can't be asked to Google. Bono was a pain on professional mode. I know there are ways to beat this game without taking damage, but I get so salty with this guy. Actually really salty. I was just taking damage upon damage, carting him around everywhere, trying to fire off shots before he sawed me in half, which he did a lot, over and over like some horrible purgatory fever dream. It was nothing but an angry blur on the hardest difficulty, and when I try to remember what happened, my vision just clouds with red and I pass out for a little bit. I almost forgot about the chief when I wrote this review too. Quite a shame considering I assumed he was the main villain on first meeting, and thought he'd be following me throughout the game in the shadows, but then he turned into a curly-whirly in a barn and I had to put him out of his disgusting misery and go off looking for a new arch nemesis. I spent a lot of time during this fight bitching that I couldn't dodge or roll out of the way, but would I have said that 15 years ago? My current gen experience made it so that I honestly couldn't imagine a different way to deal with the oncoming attacks, particularly when he swung from the rafters right into my personal space, a nice jump back button would have been really solid there. I also kept instinctively trying to dodge, an attack would fly my way, I'd press circle, I'd do nothing, I'd take damage. In a post Souls world, I need my iframes, you know? I'm an iframe junkie. I love to take a big old roll from a perfect stationary position and dodge directly through the swing of an enormous hammer. Before you say it, I know. I know that the choice I made wasn't the correct one. I know that the game was never intended to be played with Bloodborne dodging and rolling in mind. I just couldn't turn my brain off. But I mean, even a block would do. Come on, Leon, how are you alive? When this sinewy centipede finally dies, Leon Cranberry dips down and just plucks his eye out like it's no big thing. If you haven't examined the eye recognition gate and don't know you need an eye to pass through to the castle, this is a really weird scene to watch. We've also got El Gigante, some angry sentient potato who appears a few times throughout the game to thrash about and stomp Elaine Branady flat every so often, always in a different situation. We've got big empty arena with canine unit assistance, we've got long thin corridor with environmental hazards, we've got dos gigantes in a secret underground lair, you name it, Resident Evil 4 has it. I accidentally cheesed him the first time around by getting his animation stuck between two shacks, so he just stood there awkwardly while I took pot shots at his face, but the second time round he stomped them flat and then caved my head in. Speaking of reused, the Garridors are another recurring fight, an awesome concept 
left with actually surprisingly good execution. The game is old and slow and bumbly as balls, but you need to be slow to fight them, so it ends up working out. Garadors are blind, and some of them are armoured, so you need to shoot the parasite on their central back and then tiptoe off to sit quietly out of the way while they run screaming at the spot you were previously in. If you're still standing there, they'll usually just turn you into a small pile of grated cheese and shredded organs. Probably the least remarkable boss is actually the final one. I mean, Sadler's disgusting, don't get me wrong, but he's fairly standard all things considered. Sort of like rice pudding. You have to find ways to stagger him, at which point you could roll casually up onto him and stab him in the eye. You have to stab him in the eye quite a few times, and he can be staggered really easily with grenades, girders, and high damage weapons, just like you and I really. And you'll probably use almost all of your shit getting him down, and all of your health items keeping yourself up, but he's the final boss so it doesn't matter. He's a bit frustrating on professional mode, but honestly, what isn't? Professional mode really ramps up the difficulty in the same way that being dunked in lava raises your body temperature. The main thing you'll notice is that Lenny Hindenburg only takes two hits now before he dies, which, if you skip through easy mode as poorly as I did, will probably delay your arrival in the first village by about 45 minutes. His maximum health can be increased through a careful application of herbage, but you'll be extremely flimsy for the first few hours and need to make the most of the weapons you have with the limited ammo you can scrape together. On the eve of my foray into professional mode, I was literally briefed by a friend who notified me of some very key pieces of information. Six incendiary grenades can be used to kill Chief Menders, one rocket launcher for Salazar, and the magnum ammo must be preserved at all costs because for some reason, when upgraded, it's stronger than anything else. I'm the first person to admit that without this information, I'd have probably taken twice as long to finish the game. If you so wish, you can absolutely trip and fall through easy mode with an almost empty inventory. I missed the shotgun in the first town, sprinted past all the supplies, and arrived at the castle with a few unupgraded guns and a herb or two. In professional mode, you need to adapt or you'll never make it past the first encounter. You become shockingly aware of how little space there actually is to store all the herbs and guns you bought, like a trafficker at the airport terminal. I actually really like how the inventory system works. Wow, that made me sound lame. But honestly, the system is based on a briefcase with set proportions of length and width. So, briefcase wanker. The baggage themed insult. Thanks, Mum. Every item in the game is allocated a size and has to be placed in a manner known as briefcase Tetris. This isn't like Skyrim where you can belt around with 15 armor sets in your bag as long as they're below some arbitrary carry weight. In this game you have to neatly assemble them like your dad with his precious collection of Hornby trains. And you've had your eye on them for a while because you know that you really like Thomas the Tank Engine. And these trains don't have faces, but they're trains, right? So you can make believe and... Maybe even take a pot of Tipex from the cupboard next to the landline phone and paint big white smiley faces on the big collection of Hornby trains, all 24 of them sitting on the shelf with these big Tipex smiles. And then maybe step back and realise that the new faces look horrible, like stretched, screaming, dripping grins of terror. So you take the galvanised steel scourer from underneath the kitchen sink, the one mummy uses to clean the grill with, and you scrub at the Tipex faces until the white paint goes, and then you realise that all the paint is gone too. From the front of the trains anyway, so then you're just sitting there with all dead these Hornby trains around you, some covered in Tipex and some with their paint completely scraped away and he comes in and he finds you. And to this day he has never once hugged you. Anyway, what I'm trying to communicate is that you'll be struggling to find space for everything you have once you have a full arsenal of weapons available. Sure, you can combine herbs to make individual concoctions stronger and take up less space, but that's the most of it. Nothing stacks, not even grenades. It's all very realistic until Leon is darting around with three rocket launchers in his lunchbox. I hid from the simplest mechanics of this game as much as I could, until I absolutely couldn't afford to ignore them anymore. Upgrading weapons, replacing old weapons, learning which grenades were effective, using knife to conserve ammo, the target practice minigame. I was just too scared to branch out in case I ran into more problems with the control scheme, but they were always right there, pushing to be made good use of. Like a drunk person on the bus, I can't go anywhere because I need to get home, but I will put my headphones in and pretend you don't exist. Even with that kind of gear, things can change at a moment's notice. In professional mode, you waste a clip too many on an enemy with a specific weak spot, you miss a few too many shots in a horde, you throw a grenade in a situation that could have been dealt with much more simply, you're on the back foot, immediately. And you are so aware the whole time, the knowledge that a minor mismanagement of resources could land you in a boss fight with nothing to your name, that you have two hits worth of HP at any one time, inspired a panic in me I have never experienced before. For comparison's sake, I was bored shitless during Alien Isolation, getting dragged from objective to objective, knowing that the AI could just randomly decide to sniff me out in a locker or under a table. I received this worrying ambivalence, this absolute inability to give a shit. I reached such a nonchalant zen that I wandered through the few hours worth of levels before shrugging my shoulders and moving on to the next thing. Just didn't give a shit, never had a reason to, never felt like my 
own actions could ever really be optimised. Never felt like there were any stakes in what I was doing. Just shit. Tiny tangent here, but I don't know whether I missed the halcyon days of aloof, personality void protagonists, or whether they ever existed in the first place. Sure, I came to root for Leon, but was that a result of his charmless personality? Or just because I was trapped with him in this experience, relying on him to carry me through to the end? Ada too. She's smug, weirdly overdressed, condescending, rude, and wearing the shittest sunglasses I've ever seen. She smarms her way through the village, inserting herself into every situation, but also refusing to communicate or treat people around her like people. Then she just fucks off with her scarf somehow not getting caught on everything. Make up your mind, woman. Do you want to be smug and aloof from the shadows pulling the strings? Or do you want to get involved in the action and cooperate as begrudging partners? Because you can't have both. I won't let you. The time for aloof spy women in shit formal wear is finished. Be relatable. Have some decorum. Anyway, Resident Evil 4 did some weird shit to me. We whizzed through the professional playthrough in two back-to-back -back days of streams, and my small intestine was in my throat the entire time, even when I tried to get my eight hours between them. This mounting constant anxiety that made my stomach churn and my adrenaline rush, this fear that gripped me, pulled me in and shredded me, like an electric pencil sharpener. Every save point I stumbled upon was a relief so extreme I genuinely felt the stress leave my body. The breath I had trapped in my chest would suddenly come flushing out, my jaw would untense, my shoulders would loosen and untie themselves, and I'd realise how weirdly strained I'd been this whole time without ever noticing. I was wired. The music is unmistakable once you've heard it, a sound you almost subconsciously begin to associate with safety, and things I'd seen before in my first playthrough still fucked me up. The regenerators, or a delicious tidbit of utter horror, shit me up so artfully that I was a whimpering mess by the time one crashed through the door and ate my head. Luckily, my Ashley had a suit of armour on or I might have had a cardiac in my seat. Not having to keep an eye on a screaming teenager was a welcome break. I ran into so much trouble with that on easy and ended up in a near death save in the arena with the two chainsaw women at one point, as the game quick saved while I was passing through an innocent looking door. I spent a while here, either getting cleaved straight in two, watching Ashley get torn to shreds, or being helplessly pummeled into the ground while she was carried off. Kept her on. You see, if Ashley is stolen away by a villager, they'll start walking towards the closest exit on the map. If they reach that exit, a small cutscene will play and you'll fail the game. Even if you're stood right next to the exit, you could have your hand in their back pocket and Lemming Krypton will still lose them. The buffoon. I've never played a game with an escort mechanic like this before, so I was open to it, and I had much more patience than I've seen other players possess, having been oversaturated with similar titles. Of course, due to the aforementioned suit of armour, this wasn't something I needed to worry about after my first playthrough. The enemies would just grab her, awkwardly fumble, then drop her on her ass. I'd just hear, Leon, help, every three seconds instead. At least she was safe. That's what I like to think Leroy was thinking anyway. In the absolute absence of personality, the mutual vacuum of personhood, my brain decided to cope by fabricating some kind of spark between them, some intense emotional longing and connection. What I'm trying to say is that I was basically begging them to get down to it the whole time, and the game really teased me with it. Their heartfelt hand-holding as they leapt into the garbage chute together, the way Ashley pumped her fists and jump for joy whenever Lemon landed another cracking headshot, the way he called her sweetheart before their final foray. Don't worry, Ashley. I'm coming for you. Jesus, sweet mama. That was almost too much. And I can confirm that the Rule 34 is utterly scant too. Rinse that content dry in minutes. And then it happened. At the crescendo of the game, after their many shared smiles, their occasional small talk, their professional to and fro, Ashley finally drops the question. I screamed. My heart was in my chest. Finally, they'd pork. For hours, maybe days. Finally, my dreams had come true. My pairing was canon. My hopes and wishes. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. I bet that was an awkward ride home. I'm normally pretty tough on the games that I play, even if I enjoy them, because I think it's more interesting to acknowledge and discuss faults in the games than it is to just wank off about how cinematic it all is. I don't mean to sound negative, but I think that good discussion is born of constructive criticism, and I like a good bitch about tank controls. It's rare to find a game that's so hideously campy, so unintentionally hilariously written, so beautifully shit, and yet have me struggle to honestly pin a criticism to it. The characters were horrendous horror movie stereotypes, and with the exception of Ada, who was just a bit annoying, Annoying, seem to be complete parodies, so how could I, in good faith, have anything negative to say about them? Why don't you do us all a favor and leave before the audience gets pissed off? <laughs> You're nothing but an extra in my script, so don't get too carried away. Your biggest sink is over. I don't ever remember being a part of your crappy script. Well then, why don't you show me what a first class script is like through your own actions? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Every line came together to form this beautiful tapestry of cringe, and I was hanging on every word, and wincing at every word too. The controls sucked dick, but again, it's hard to see any point in criticising a 15-year-old game. All the problems I could have pointed out have probably been seen and addressed millions of times over. I'm not doing any good by just adding to the pile. Instead, I have a reluctant respect for the control scheme of the game. It's a relic, you know? Can't fault the cavemen for drawing lines on the wall, it's all they knew. In fact, I'd actually recommend this game, with a caveat of course. Stick with it, and don't allow yourself to get too invested in our main duo. It's never worth the heartbreak. I mean, Lima, I respect your right to say no. You're a man, you're allowed your agency, your consent, I would never expect you to go through with something that made you uncomfortable, but just please, please tell me, why did you say no?